We're talking today with Bill Williams of Lake George, Colorado. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project, and we're conducting this interview at the 2015 Ripcord Reunion. Okay, Bill, can you start us off with some background on yourself? And to begin with, uh, uh, where and when were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in Muscatine, Iowa. I lived in a farm, uh, on a farm in uh, near Wapalo, Iowa. Uh, I was born the 20th of September, 1941. Uh, I went to high school, uh, graduated from high school, Wapalo High School. I played football, uh, that sort of thing. The school was so small that you could just about play anything you wanted to <laughs> and get on the team. Uh, then one summer I uh, made a trip with some friends. We saved up our hay baling money and went out to Colorado. And that was the first glimpse of the mountains. And the mountains have a tendency to some people grab you and found out there was a college out there. And of course my mother insisted that I go to college for some reason. I think to get me out of the house. But, but uh, I went to Colorado State University and I'd always wanted to be in the in the Army and I joined ROTC and at that time it was still a policy for all freshmen and sophomore male males to be in for two years in ROTC and I, I enjoyed it Army ROTC and uh, uh, got into advanced my sophomore year or senior or junior year and went to summer camp at Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, did well there. Came back and I was the uh, cadet uh, regimental commander for half the year. Made a mess of things of doing that. But. All right. I'm going to back up and fill a few things in. You said you'd always wanted to, to be uh, in the service. Yeah. Um, but where did that come from? Or I have no idea other than the fact I didn't want to be a farmer. That was too damned hard work. And uh, I don't know, I guess I grew up also remembering World War II, or first parts of World War II, or the last parts. Last parts, because you were only and, four years old when it ended, so. And uh, then Korea, I remember mm -hmm. Korea and war very well. And I, it just sounded like something I wanted to do. I wanted to get out and travel, I wanted to get out to do things, uh, and the Army, Contrary to what people, a lot of people believe, you do a lot of different things. If you're an infantry officer, you not you're not just out walking around in the mud, and you're you're doing a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. But mainly, it's the people that I enjoyed okay. being with. So, Ben, go back a little bit there. Then, to when you were kidnapped, was were your family farmers? Yes. Okay. So you knew what that was, and uh, what part of Iowa? Southeast mm -hmm. corner. We were on near the Iowa and the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would be the nearest larger town? Pardon? What would be the nearest larger town? Or are there none out of town uh, there? Muscatine, Burlington. Burlington, uh, okay. Uh, that's another thing. I got into Vietnam the last time. Uh, we were in the, spe in the uh, 101st Replacement Center for about a week. And every day there was a new infantry captain come in and they were all, we were all from Iowa. There were seven of us and none of us had ever heard of the other guy's hometown. Mm -hmm. There were so many little right. things. Okay, so and then when did you uh, finish college? 1963. Okay, I talk a little bit about the ROTC program. What did they actually have you do in that? Well, most of our instructors were, were really good. Most of the, uh, well all of the officers had uh, combat experience in World War II and Korea. On all the NCOs were combat veterans of World War II. Different. One guy had fought the uh, Japanese in, in, the, in Asia. Uh, the, my mentor was a man named Major Martin Nyer, who had climbed the cliffs at Pondo Hawk as a 19-year-old ranger mm -hmm. and fought through the war. Uh, then had was I think he was a first sergeant in Korea, and uh, got a battlefield commission in Korea, and he was kind of the guy that he used to teach us how to the 
uh, normal, th not normal things, but think common sense things. He said, when you're going through a chow line as an officer, and some kid's in there on KP, and that was in the days at KP, and he's throwing the potatoes on your tray, you don't yell at him, just say thanks, son. Because you never know that might do things for him and or not. He also taught us how to kill people. He was very good about that. Uh, it was, a, you know, as a matter of fact, business, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And other other ones uh, taught us how, like Major, well, he's still alive. Colonel Patterson's still alive. He taught us how the, the common sense things about managing your business, your affairs, honor, an officer's word, and that sort of thing. They taught us how to be a, if you listened to him and believed him, you know, he taught you how to be a man and an officer. Okay. And then you said you did a, a summer training session once you were in the lab. Yeah, the program. summer camp. Yeah, and where was that? Fort Riley, Kansas. Okay. And what did you do there? <sighs> Sweated a lot. Chiggers. Uh, well, we, the weird training, you had, you had uh, different positions. You would go in for everything from a squad leader to a company commander. And uh, you were graded on all that. And I really enjoyed it. It was my thing I always wanted to do. I was living, I was being a real soldier. I was living in a barracks. Having, right. having a good time. Okay, obviously you, you did well in it if you got to be. So you were commandant for one half of the year? Or the, yeah, or then, then another guy that was custom, that, then another guy would take over. Mm -hmm. And so did you really make a hash of the job? I thought I did. But, <laughs> but I had I had I had fun doing it. Now I, I guess I wasn't all that bad. But dude, you know, there's some things I didn't know what I was doing, and I always excelled at that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and so you finished that of '63, and then uh, what is? Do you get the commission, or do you have to get a further training first, or how does that no, work? No, they commission you at college, and then you go in and you go to the, you go into Fort Benning. Georgia, which is the infantry center, mm -hmm. and we'll go to infantry officer basic course, which was, gosh, I don't know how many long months that was. It's been so long. And then after that, I went to jump school. And after that, then I was, went on to, uh, to Korea. Okay. Uh, take us through the uh, infantry officer training school at Fort Benning. Well, that was, that taught you everything from, uh, how you adjust artillery mortar fire in, how you maneuver your troops, uh, inspections, uh, gosh, I can try to remember all that sort of, maintenance, <laughs> maintenance of vehicles. I remember we were being taught by this old warrant officer, Hardy Bachelor, Mr. Hardy Bachelor, warrant officer. <laughs> And he uh, had been a boxer, you could tell. He's, he had cauliflower ears and his nose was all across his face. You could tell nobody screwed with Hardy. And Hardy was given a script to follow when he was giving this class. And uh, I remember he would talk about Fern Dervis. And nobody knew what the hell Fern Dervis was. And we later figured out it was foreign debris. But nobody had the balls to tell Hardy that it's foreign debris Hardy, not Fern Dervis. So it's, it was Fern Dervis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the funny thing, his, his cousin was our first sergeant in college, Richard Bachelor. Okay. Um, did they have any resemblance to each other? No, they didn't even know each other. Okay. Well, his cousin, our first sergeant, did, but mm -hmm. Mr. Bachelor did. I met him later in uh, the Third Special Forces Group and asked him about that. <laughs> I never corrected the Fern Derpus either. Oh, well. All right. So you do, now, is the infantry training, is it all on Fort Benning, or did they send you anyplace else? No, it was all on Fort Benning because you had, to, you had a variation of terrain uh, there at Fort Benning. It was all pretty miserable terrain, which is, I don't think they ever picked a post that had good terrain, you know, that was pleasant to be in. Yeah, maybe not. 
And of course, it was also summer when you're doing this because you graduated yes. from college yes. and you're there and you're very in pleasant. Yeah. Time, yeah. Okay. So. so you finish that, all right, and then jump school. What did that consist of? Well, I think jump school was three weeks. You had to be in pretty good physical shape for that, and uh, they held out. Like over, they, we had a large class, like six hundred students into that, and it, the first week is uh, is ground week and they teach you how to land, BLFs they call it. You went through that. Second week is what they call tower week, and they have these 34-foot towers. I guess they figured 34 feet was the optimum height that most people are scared to death at. And so that's what the Army figured they would scare the hell out of if they could weed the people out. And you, you go up this, and the stairs, and they have a harness on, and they hook you up. Then you stand in the door, and you jump out, and you're connected to this cable, and you slide out. It got to be kind of fun after a while. But then you had to have five successful exits. They have to teach you how to exit the aircraft properly. And, uh, of course, you never get a successful uh, exit to start with. Nobody, I don't care who you are. This may be your general going through. But uh, eventually, you know, if you try hard enough, there'll be a sergeant down there and you have to, everything you have, you have to run everywhere except mm -hmm. up the stairs. And then if you screw up, which you're always doing no matter what, you have to do push-ups. You're pushing the way George is, we used to call it. And I remember uh, we'd run into the PT pits and there'd be the overhanging bars and you have to do pull-ups. And, I, and then you have to ask the sergeant for permission to let go. And the sergeant came up to me and he says, uh, you think you're pretty good, don't you, Lieutenant? Met his face, you know. And I thought, if I say no, he's going to say, then what in the hell are you doing being an officer? And I say, yes, Sergeant Airborne. Everything had to end with Airborne. Yes, Sergeant Airborne. He says, I'm going to watch you. Never saw the bastard again. But he was just, you know, just trying to scare the mm -hmm. shit out of you. All right. Which they always do. It. They are very well practiced at it. Sure. You were talking about uh, making the exits out of the aircraft. Now, is there sort of a something set up on the top of the tower? That's tower. Yeah, it's a, it looks like an aircraft door mm -hmm. that you'll be going out of, and you stand there and you have your hands like this, and your feet are propped in a certain way, and you're supposed to spring out. And actually, it got so that I'd have to, I'd actually get in a crouch, and just jump as far as I could outside, to finally qualify. Now, were you basically attached to a, a rope or harness, or you dropped down, or was it still the way? Yeah, wire? you fell probably six, eight, ten feet, and then you hit this cable, mm -hmm. and that gave you a simulation of uh, the opening shock. Right. And then you slid down and. There was a berm at the end, and you slam into that thing, and then you get unhooked, and you run back down to the sergeant. Right. So then third week, you get to jump out of airplanes. Yes. That was the easy week, because you didn't have to do as much running. You sat in what they called the sweat shed. You put your, you had your harness on and your parachute on, and I don't know how these guys did it, but there's always some guys that have to take a leak so bad they can't stand it because it's, you're nervous. Mm -hmm. And how they ever did it, I, I just don't know they did, how they did it. <laughs> I never, thank God, I never did. And then you'd load up in your aircraft and they'd take you and you'd fly over to Alabama to the Friar, I think it's Friar Field, and jump. And uh, I remember what, there's a ditch runs through that place. It's a little bitty creek in it when we were there. And I came in backwards, I remember, and landed on the backside like that. I mean, you're supposed to land on your toes, your side of your leg, and your, your uh, push-up muscle here, and roll in like that. And I hit on my three points of contact, heel ass and head, and rolled down to that mud hole, and my butt hurt, and I thought, man, I'm going to, I'm just going to sit here and rub my butt for a while. Nobody will see me. <laughs> The sergeant jumps up out of the weeds and screams at me. <laughs> so then, then, then you're supposed to roll your parachute up and put it in the bag and 
you put the put it over your head like this, and your reserve shoots in front, and, and run off the field. Well, I thought, hell, I don't want to run that far. That's a long way. I said, now, how in the hell does that sergeant know people are running? And I look over there. It's because your bag is bouncing up and down. So I walked off, bounced, and I got within about 100 yards of the area where you'd take your shoot in and hang it up, and I, then I'd run in. So I thought I got over there. That's about the only thing I ever got over those guys with. Mm -hmm. All right, so was that your first jump that that happened to you on? Yeah, I think. I think that was the, the best jump because it was a, the first one, and finally you get to do what you've been trained to do, mm -hmm. and you realize, man, this is the most exhilarating thing I've, I think I've done lately. Okay. So now you have lot so the jump from school is just like three weeks? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then from there? Korea. Okay. I remember uh, my older brother of two years was in the Army. He was a stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky. He was a uh, Spec 4. So I was going to drive up to see him. And that was the day Kennedy was killed. I remember mm -hmm. that driving. My, I was driving out of Fort Benning. I went into Rome, Georgia, and I heard it on the radio. And I stopped off and saw my brother, and, and then went on home to Iowa. Okay. Spent 30 days and shipped out to Korea. Okay. So when? How did they get you to Korea? Oh, uh, what air, I don't remember what airline it was, but we were out Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm and got on the airplane then. I, I remember another lieutenant, second lieutenant, his name was Roosevelt Ludd. And I sat together, he's a nice guy. And I got, we got to Korea and landed at uh, Kempo. Mm -hmm. I remember, uh, you could see the tower at Kempo still had bullet holes in it. And never saw Roosevelt again until the day I left. And then I was assigned to the 7th Infantry Division. Uh, the day I got there, the the currency, you don't use Ameri we didn't use American currency, we used MPC, military. Uh, Pay certificate or whatever that was. Yes, it was funny money. Uh, monopoly money that we had called it different things. So they changed, the, there we were stuck for a day and uh, we went to uh, the officers club that night and they had a slot machine. And I found out later that people really guard their slot machine because it's their money in that damn slot and they don't want anybody from outside winning anything. And one of the guys hit the jackpot and boy, they, would, they could have hung him because he won all their money. And, he was, and we shipped out the next day up to, uh, to our units. Okay. And then were you up uh, close to the DMZ? Or? No, we were the reserve division. First Cavalry Division was the one on the line. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, we were behind them. Once, uh, what was it, twice a year you had to walk from your position up and back, which is, I don't know, 40 some mile hikes. And we did it in the winter time. And I remember they had this, these two incompetent captains were supposedly leading us and they couldn't have let a boy scout to a candy store and they got us lost. And we wandered all over the Korea that night and we didn't have any water. We were eating snow which is not a good thing to do in Korea and, or it may, just makes you thirstier. Plus Korea is not known for its cleanliness anyway. Not at least in the rural areas. Well, no. Okay, so um, what basically what kind of duty did you have in, in Korea? First, I had the best duty in the, in the army. I was a rifle, for, of course, I was concerned, mm -hmm. rifle platoon leader. And I remember uh, my platoon sergeant was named Gilbert Shinitsky, Sergeant Shinitsky. And I remember I come in. I came into the company, and I was interviewed by the company commander. And he said, and I remember this very distinct: "I'm giving you two, mm -hmm. Sergeant Janiski. Not 
I'm irritating first platoon. And Snitsky was an old Korean War veteran, and he was the type of character that uh, everything was a conspiracy to him. He, when he talked to you, it was he would look both sides <laughs> all the time. Well, you know, Lieutenant, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, he was uh, murdered over there, as a matter of fact. Uh, one of the guys had been in trouble with the, he got picked up by the MPs and brought back to the unit. Shinisky brought him back. And he got out and dressed up in his combat equipment walked over to the ammo dump and buffaloed this kid who was brand new and got in there, got ammunition, and then he was going to walk back and kill some MPs. Well, they found out about it, and Shinisky went with the MPs, and they found this guy, and he was in the back of the jeep and got out, and I know Shinisky, when he, he talked to the guy, he used every profane language he could use, and the guy turned around and emptied his M14 and uh, killed uh, him and seriously wounded both MPs, and then took off, and a guard from the local finance outfit, who all had, it was, an, it was a 45 and one bullet in his pocket. He shot that kid in the arm, that kid, put his bullet in there and shot and killed the, uh, McCoy, was the guy's name. Mm -hmm. So that was my first taste of losing somebody. And how far into your tour did that happen? Towards the end, uh, but no, a little bit more in the, past the middle of it, because mm -hmm. they try to change your jobs mm -hmm. after about six months. Okay. And, uh, I was acting company commander at that time because the company commander had gone home on an emergency leave, as a matter of fact. And then they switched me from a rifle platoon leader to heavy mortar platoon leader for the, my rest of my tour. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what impression did you have of, of the soldiers who were over there at the time? Well, they were good. They were, some of them weren't very well educated. Uh, we had some co white rocks and the guys that had, had written Weapons Charlie up there. Well, then somebody from another company come in and steal all the rocks and they'd write what they wanted to do. So at night, these guys would get together and fight it out. And I come up in the morning and I see Weapons Charlie, only the N was backwards. Mm -hmm. So I get a hold of one of the guys and I said, uh, you see anything wrong with the sign up there? Hey, sir, God damn it, sir, I know. He says, I was talking between those two guys from Tennessee and I'm from Arkansas and we had an argument and I said the end goes like this and they said it doesn't, mm -hmm. it goes, and that since there was two of them, they won. <laughs> so uh, the, some of them weren't very well educated, but they were good men, good men. Uh, and how much did you get to see of, of Korea or the, the people or the army or anything? I got to Seoul one time on a weekend. The rest of the time is just driving through. Mm -hmm. uh, rest of the time it was, you saw the countryside and being a, a kid from a farm, the, the rice paddy work, and I remember going on a road march, we were on a 20 mile road march. In the winter, cold or hell, and we walked by this farmhouse. Remember, we were up here. And the farm was there was a stream down here, and there was a Korean house, and there was Mama San on the in the river. She had chopped a hole in the ice and was washing her clothes, and you could tell from where we were, her hands were just bright red, mm -hmm. and I thought, damn anybody at home ever complains about their washing clothes in a washing machine. Uh, tell them about that woman there. They were very, very hard-working people. Best thieves I had ever seen. We had uh, continuous problems with what we called slicky boys. 
uh, they could steal your, well, as a matter of fact, they stole music from a guy, uh, his radio. And they, they could steal the radio and leave the music behind, they'd say, because they get a little transistor cheapo radio. They come in and steal your radio, listen to what station you were playing, turn it to that, and you say, you're sleeping away, and take your expensive radio and leave the cheap <laughs> one. They were something. Right. To what extent um, had the place recovered from the war, which was end of 10 years earlier? The, the, the farmers were still as, uh, as primitive, so to speak, as they had been for probably when the Japanese occupied mm -hmm. the place. Uh, Seoul was, uh, was becoming quite a metropolis then, although there were still a lot of problems there. Now, it's nothing like it is now, I understand now, it's just, it's really quite a city. Uh, like I said, when we got off the air, uh, the plane, the, the, the tower at Kempo still had machine gun holes in it, bullet holes in it. Did you work at all with the Korean military? No. Well, in a sense, we had three, we had called Katusas, and they were attached to the American Army. I had a sergeant, a corporal, and a private, and when I had the heavy mortars, and when we get to a place and we dig in, dig our mortar position in, and I'd tell the sergeant, it was, it was funny, tell, you tell the sergeant to do something, he goes over and gets the corporal. Corporal go gets the private, and the private does whatever work is done, and those two are standing around supervising him because that's and they were very the Koreans were very physical. Uh, they beat the crap out of out of them, and that was nothing uh, unusual about about that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, anything else that kind of stands out in your memory about the time in Korea? Yeah, went home. And I've met Roosevelt Ludd again, mm -hmm. and he and I were flying back at night. We flew back at night, and they came up on Northern California, and then flew back down to Travis. And Roosevelt had the window next, uh, had the seat next to the window, and we flew over the mountains there. What does that be? The Sierras? Mm -hmm. I don't know. And it was all covered with snow. Well, it looked just like Korea because it was in. November, December, when we came back. And he got all excited that they'd taken us back to Korea. All right, so where do you go next? Oh, let's see, I had volunteered while in Korea. We had these guys come from uh, Okinawa, I believe, from the first Special Forces group. And they were on a, a kind of a recruiting tour uh, for Special Forces. So I had volunteered for Special Forces. I'd also done a, another, I forgot to tell you, stupid thing. Uh, the Tonkin Gulf incident occurred while I was there in mm -hmm. Korea. And another fellow and I, another lieutenant and I, put in for what we called an inner theater transfer. And we put in a theater transfer to Korea, or to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He got it, and I was sent because I'd already volunteered for Special Forces to Fort, he was killed as a matter of fact. And then I went to, I went to Fort Bragg, went through Special Forces training. And okay, and now what does Special Forces training consist of? Whew. It was uh, probably the most interesting uh, training I'd ever been through. It taught us, because I am kind of a sneaky dog anyway, and it taught us how to how to uh, explosives, uh, ambush, and uh, organization of guerrillas, and it was only a three, it was a three month course because of the war. And as soon as you got out of that course, you went through another three month course on how to kill guerrillas before you went to Vietnam. It was a kind of pre-deployment training. It was a, it was the most thorough and interesting training as far as I was concerned that I'd been through, and the uh, NCOs that we had were all combat veterans from World War II, Korea. Even had I even went through language training with uh, a sergeant from the uh, 
the Devil's Brigade. I don't know if you're the. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, the, the the language we all had Vietnamese. That was our language training. Was the, was Vietnamese, which might as well was a waste of time for me because I can I can remember to say, look, there's a helicopter, and have you eaten yet? That's about. Yeah, it's not an easy language to learn, as far as I can tell. No. no. Yeah. And when you're doing this training, is it all in the same place, or do they move you around for different kinds of terrain, or what do they do? Well, we were at Fort Bragg, and yes, they moved us around Fort Bragg mm -hmm. for different, different training. Uh, we did a lot of night work and parachute jumping and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing uh, out in the field. Okay. And when they're giving you this... Training. To what extent were they now gearing the training for Southeast Asia? It was all pretty much for that, because that, we were all going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I remember the, one of the first things they had us do was the swimming test. And my swimming level, or why, when I floating level is about right here. And I remember they fed us uh, creamed potatoes and uh, probably meatloaf and some other really nice light meal just mm -hmm. before that. And then they made us jump in the water and we had to swim three laps of the pool. And I, it, I just, I had to take remedial swimming again when I got out of that, when I got back to my unit before. <laughs> Is that, I'm not a, much of a water man anyway, as, as I told somebody, my ancestors were like me, they all came over chained to the bottom of the boat, because mm -hmm. we're not water people. Yeah, much happier in mountains. Yes. Okay, all right. So how long does this whole training program last? Well, the one first phase was three months, and then the second phase was another three months, and then there were guys uh, pulled out early of the second phase and shipped out. As a matter of fact, some of them were killed before the rest of us graduated. Mm -hmm. So when did you finish? When was it? Jeez, I, it's been so long ago. Was it getting to be the latter part of 65 by then? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, almost 66. Okay. And then we, we uh, had, had leave, got leave. And went to Travis Air Force Base again, and that's where we flew out of. Yeah. I remember the difference now, because I have friends who are in the SF Special Forces now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they go, th go through quite an elaborate procedure getting their beret. And I was telling one, I says, hell, when I went in, I went in the supply room and the guy tossed two berets like with frisbees across the, the counter, and that was it. Now that I, they have something now that's much more elaborate and meaningful. All right, but you were getting a green beret. Now, what was the function of the Special Forces in Vietnam? Are you getting over the beginning of 66 now? Was that? Yeah. Okay. The, initially, we would go out into these camps. Say we'd set up, it'd be like a fort in the old days in Indian territory. Mm -hmm. And you would recruit uh, the indigenous personnel from around there and train them into be your soldiers. You bring their families in and everything. So it was just a whole little community, but it was fortified in mm -hmm. towers, machine gun towers and minefields and that sort of thing. And you'd run patrols out uh, you have an AO, or an area of operation, where you would, uh, that was your responsibility keeping the bad guys out of there. And the first camp I was in, I was the XO, and we didn't have a lot of activities there. We were near uh, a city called Natrang. Mm -hmm. uh, although in, I remember May of 1966, we were on patrol and we walked right in the middle of a camp and they boogied out. Uh, well, they ambushed. One guy was sent out and ambushed us. We got him and a little, little mountain yard 
which is the mountain indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're different from the Vietnamese. Uh, they're different in authenticity. Uh, nice people, nice people. They're almost Polynesian in appearance. Mm -hmm. And he was carrying a big old BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle, weighs of 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's big, it's almost as big as he was. So he was lagging behind. We got ambushed and pinned down, and here comes old Mountain Yard. Oh, so he just sprays it out and breaks up the, the, the ambush. And, and we went in there, and it was like I say in May, and it was their May Day. They had gone into there to celebrate the Communist May Day. Mm -hmm. And I still have it. I still have the flag. We captured a, a, a communist party, a communist flag, mm -hmm. red flag with a hammer and sickle yep. in it. Normally we sell that sort of thing to the Air Force, but that was too good of a mm -hmm. prize. All right. Now, yeah, because I guess we tend to think of, of special forces and this kind of thing happening up closer to the, the frontier, but Natrang is along the coast. Yeah. But at this point, so there's, was this the project you could tell us or Viet Cong or local Communist mm -hmm. forces yeah, that you were dealing with, yeah. First one I ever saw killed was a 19-year-old girl. She was walking point, carrying a carby. Mm -hmm. Guy shot her right in the head. Now, uh, how long did you spend in that area? I was there until I, I was a first lieutenant then, mm -hmm. and I, then I stayed there until I made captain. And then I asked to be shipped to someplace else because I wanted to get another part of the country. And uh, they sent me up to play coup, which is in two corps. Mm -hmm. And the only job they had open at that time, and they, we called them, we had the A team, which was the basic 12 man team. And then you had the B team, which controlled the A teams. And then you had the C team, and they're all different names now, uh, which controlled all the B teams. So I was sent to the to C team, and I became the funds officer for two corps, which means I handled 90 million piastres, which is was their fund, a month, which is worth about a, a million dollars. And that was, I had that job for four months, and I'd have to go to Saigon every month, pick up that money, and come back up. And nobody would ever give me an airplane. They wouldn't give me an, an airplane to fly and I had to go out and bang on, walk up and down the flight line and say, hey, can you guys, there'd be me and a clerk mm -hmm. and an interpreter, can you guys fly us up to the play coup or down there? And one time I got on one and, uh, and had to leave the interpreter behind and he got the plane the next day and I fell asleep on the plane that was an otter or something, single engine plane. And the guy says, well, we can't make it. The weather's too bad. We've been flying over Laos for a while. And I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> So we ended up, and I spent the night someplace, and they came out with armed guards. And, and I had well, I had all the money was, was kept in mailbags. I had 1,500 pounds of money. Mm -hmm. And everything, a little five piaster note to a hundred piaster note. And I stayed there and I finally got back up to play coup and finally talked to people and said, hey, can't you guys give me a slot on a plane once a damn month to go to Saigon mm -hmm. and back? Uh, they finally, finally decided that, that was, because I figured some idiot's going to throw a grenade in the back of that truck one of these days when I, when I go to the Bank of Tokyo mm -hmm. and get the money. Okay. Now, uh, was the money mostly to pay the indigenous, local soldiers? Yeah, yeah indigenous soldiers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, the time you were there, I mean, how much activity was going on with these different teams that were out there? Oh, it's kind of it was kind of hit and miss. Uh, some were real quiet. In other places, they were. The Play Me camp, I remember, was uh, was a hot place. <laughs> oh yeah, that reminds me. That was. The, the guy who was the former camp commander of that Special Forces camp commander had, was then the S1 of the C team. And one day he comes up and he says, hey Bill, can you take <coughs> this uh, 
USO or whatever it is, a lady out to play me, play me camp. I said, yeah, okay. So we get in an airplane or a chopper and we fly out there. And I knew the team sergeant. And he comes up, he says, who's this woman? And I said, Joe, I have no idea who in the hell she is, other than being American. So he says, what do you do, lady? And she says, I'm a stripper. And that, <laughs> and that oh, I was a hero there for a while. And she put on an act for him. She was big. She was about six foot. So they brought the little Vietnamese camp commander in. He was a hell of a little guy. He was a fighter. So they brought him in, and he was sitting in there. And the Vietnamese word for oh my god, like oh my god, is choi oi, choi oi. And she's doing her little dance, and she goes, throws her dress over the top of his head, and brings him into her boobs. And all you can hear is choi oi, choi oi. <laughs> But that, that, that was, that they had been under attack for a long time, but they never got, they never got over mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and what impression did you have of sort of how things were going in Vietnam at that time? Could you tell if we were winning or losing or holding our own or? I thought we were kicking some butt, but uh, there was so much uh, at the top, so much politics. Mm -hmm that uh, we had a joke about the Johnson, President Johnson's mushroom policy. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Keep them in the dark, feed them horseshit. You know, uh, and we didn't have a lot of respect for the Vietnamese. We, the, they were called the Luk Luk Duk Bien, LLDB, and we called them the lousy little dirty bastards. So there wasn't a lot of respect because some of them would, some are great fighters. Some of them were good. The other ones were more interested in running bars and whorehouses than they were anything. Okay. I knew them both. Uh, other incidents from that tour that kind of stand out for you? Mm, not really. I was uh, trying to get home. Okay. I remember getting, when we got back to the States, uh, how indifferent, to say it lightly, the people were, and downright nasty uh, they were. Although if you wore a beret, they were scared of you. They stayed away from you. They wouldn't insult you too much. Mm -hmm. too much. It was different the second tour, much different. Okay. So when did you get home the first time? Early 67 or? Yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, I spent leave at home in, uh, in Iowa, which was completely different from the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, you still had guys there from World War II and Korea that if you wore the uniform, you're, you were all right. Uh, and then I got assigned uh, to Fort Benning, Georgia, home of the infantry, as an infantry instructor mm -hmm. at the infantry school. Went through, an, it was a pretty grueling course, eight week uh, course in uh, how to be an instructor pe uh, speech. Eight hours a day for three weeks, I guess it was three weeks. But it was, it was compared to college, I remember taking college courses I mm -hmm. remember it was it was comparable to that even better even better because uh, and then I became an instructor in the weapons department small arms committee I gave a class on uh, what they called quick kill snap shooting because uh, most of the time in heavy jungle you don't have time to and one of the best parts about it you became a very good uh, Shotgun shot, snap shooter. Mm -hmm. Yes, he would. I could teach most people. We used Daisy BB guns. I could teach most people to hit either a nickel or a penny in the air within 20 minutes with a BB gun. Throw it in the air and hit it. Hit it. Right. Uh, now, when you were in the field with uh, the special forces, what kind of weapons did you have? 
The carry to 16, M16. Okay. We got towards the end, we got this uh, carbine model, short one, mm -hmm. and everybody wanted to use that one. We used, they only, they only gave us one. Yeah. I remember they did try to mortar us once. Uh, we had what we called uh, H&I fire, has, hazardous or harassment and interdiction. Yeah. Yeah. And we used an old four deuce. So if you were on guard duty, you'd go out and you'd had the rounds all prepared. You'd drop it down the tube and poop it off and then you'd give it a crank and move it. And, and uh, we had uh, we had a practice alert that night in which we got all the people, all the mountain yards out on their positions and fired illumination mm -hmm. in the air and that sort of thing. And then we came back in the team house and we're discussing, got different guys who were talking about the companies they were assigned to, how they were doing. And all of a sudden we heard in the distance, boom, 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 boom. And then all the, all the lights went out, we turned all the lights off. And nothing hit inside the, the compound. Well, the next morning we got up and we could see out in a rice paddy, quite a ways out there, all these craters. And we found that they had uh, evidently set up about that same time we had the practice alert. And the only thing I can think is they thought we knew they were coming and this VC or NBA decided he had a quota of mortar rounds. He was forced to shoot at the Americans, and he shot, and then he got the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. So that was the when they never did come into our camp. Okay. All right. Um, so we kind of go back. You're talking about uh, infantry school and being an instructor, and mm -hmm. okay. Um, and then how long did you actually do that job? I was there for about, uh, well, a total time, about 18 months, because I went to Infantry Officer Advanced Course, Captain's Course, mm -hmm. after that. But uh, mainly that was, they gave you that t that type of job is, you know, that was your, you got time to rest because you're going to go back. Right. Okay. And then uh, what do they do for training captains? Because you already were a captain, right? Yes. But, but this yeah. Is... yeah. It was... Uh, I was never one to be a great student uh, that I can remember. It's been a, it's been a, I remember there were four of us in that course. There were like 300 in the class, and there were four Captain Williamses. Mm -hmm. And the joke was if they would call Captain Williams, what's the... Uh, and I'd stand up and I'd say, which Captain Williams is that? Is that mm -hmm. William or David or... And they'd and they say, well, he's sitting over there, and then I'd sit down. And of course, they'd nail my ass the next, mm -hmm. the next question. Oh, anything. Most of it, like, it was logistics, teaching, uh, and strategy, tactics on a higher level, that sort of thing. I, I really, you know, like I say, it's been so long. And I, uh, <laughs> I still have come in contact with the guy sitting next to me, Robbie Robinson. Uh, he, uh, he and I... We're at Fort Carson together, as a matter of fact. But uh, if it wasn't for him, I, I, I used to have slept through the course. If it wasn't for Robbie, I wouldn't have made it. All right. Do you think they taught you anything useful in that course? or? Oh, yeah, they did. But it was it, is, it was at a higher level than, say, the when I was a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. you know, tactics, more at a battalion level and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and then... When, so are you then ready to go back to Vietnam? Is that the next step? Or? Yep. 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 I wasn't married then. And we had this, what they call the orders party. And the wives were not a happy bunch. Because normally in a, if without the war, there'd be a bunch of guys going to Europe or mm -hmm. Alaska or somewhere. And everybody but just all but the West Pointers were going back to Vietnam. The West Pointers had served their one tour and they were going to go get their master's degree mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. I knew one guy, Ted Morgan, that uh, he volunteered to go back with the 4th Division 
and they yanked him out of there and sent him off to get his master's degree. Mm -hmm. The way the rest of us felt like cannon fodder. To, but. Okay. Now, did you get orders for a specific unit, or were you just going to go to Vietnam and go where they wanted you? They would give you a number, and then a code, and then you would look the code up, and you what unit you were being drawn against. But I found out later it didn't make any difference because once you got to Vietnam, you could volunteer for whatever unit you wanted to. But I I wanted to go to the hundred first anyway, so. I'd been drawn against the 101st, so I, no, I'll, I'll go with them. Okay, and why did you want to go to the 101st? Oh, it just the unit was had good reputation, and you don't want to go with some rum dumb bunch that don't know their bass from a hole in the ground, you know. Okay, so when are you going back over? When did I go back over? March of 60, no, no, de December, November, December, of 69, because mm -hmm. I remember I got there That's for the Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving thing. Yeah. Thanksgiving, I had Thanksgiving sat there by myself, right, I got there about 2 o'clock, yeah. And explain kind of where you were, what the, can you tell me about that off the camera? Oh, well, yeah, uh, we were up in i which is the top of Vietnam, and, it, and believe it or not, that place, it was, it got cold up there by Vietnam standards. And of course, the rainy season, it was wet, and uh, got up in there, and let's see. Oh, the, they're going to land in Tonsonut, and uh, they got us all together who was going to go where, and got a plane load, and oh, they said, oh, you guys can't go up there right now. That's a too long a flight plan and the pilots already have so many hours uh, under their belt today, and you guys have to stay here. Okay, well then they come up with some pilots who can go, and I remember the plane, somebody had spilled milk on the bottom of the plane that soured, so that was a lovely. Mm -hmm. And then we were flying up there, and the pilot ran out of time, and he says, well, we're going to land here at Cameron Bay. I think it was Cameron Bay. He says, any of you boys here from West Texas, you'll feel right at home, there's a sandstorm blowing. So we get there and they're gonna put us up for the night and take us off the next morning, guaranteed. And of course, they get in, we get in these bunks and they're full of sand, I remember that. Three o'clock in the morning, they roused us out. Oh, plane, you guys can fly on up now to i -Corps. So we get up there and the truck picks us up, takes us into this prison camp with intense and it's muddy and sloppy and the truck comes to pick us up and it almost falls in the So why were you in a prison camp? Because it was too bad for prisoners, it was only good for us. That was the joke. Yeah, but what was it officially? I don't know. I mean was it a transient officer barracks or was it just some place that stuck you? Must have been. It could have been a prison camp, I don't know. But, uh, now, was this um, at, at Fubai or someplace else? I, uh, I couldn't tell you where it was. Then they shipped us, they took us up in a truck and they took us into uh, the into 101st and we at the uh, Sears Screaming Eagle Replacement Center. Mm -hmm. And we spent a week or so uh, for the new guys primarily, mm -hmm. getting them acclimated to the the country, and we were supposed to go out on this big patrol, and we got ambushed on the patrol, or some some character popped out of a hole and shot at somebody, and the whole thing just went to hell. Because you had people who were clerks and jerks and whatever, and they had no idea. So wonder they didn't shoot each other. Mm -hmm. And then they brought helicopter gunships out, and whoever that little bastard was, <laughs> she created hell. Now, did you go with them on that patrol? Or did yeah, you? oh yeah. Okay. yeah. So you didn't get a pass because you've already been in special no, forces? No, no, as a matter of like fact, that. you made me company commander. Uh. I wish they had given me a pass on that. But that was the most gut, goat screw I'd been in, in a while, you know. I um, see. So as company commander, you, you, you walk your guys into an ambush? I don't like the way you said that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I was company commander for logistics and counting heads. Okay. So, no, they had they had these guards or not mm -hmm. guards, but they had these guys supposed to be training. Right, right. Train, they were trainers. That was yeah, their job. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that since, uh, since you said that. I hadn't walked anybody into an ambush since '66. All right. Uh, so you kind of go through all of that, and then what's your first assignment then with the 101st? Uh, I was sent up to the 3rd Brigade, and uh, I was hoping to get a rifle company. So I talked to the adjutant at the S1, and uh, his lieutenant, nice kid, and I asked him what the situation was, and he said, oh, we're, we're full. Uh, and he said, then he says, where I asked him where all the three battalions were. Well, one was out in the, in the, in the sand on the, on the beach area. And I didn't want to go out there and they had, they were over several captains. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I found out later in some places you go in there and, and they would have a whole bunch of captains over and the guy said, what are these? Guys, do it. Why we got all these excess caps? Well, they don't want the company. And to me, that that was in, I could not uh, comprehend that. And uh, I told the agent, I said, "Well, if you haven't got a company open, could you keep me here at brigade until a company opens up? Because that way, I'd have a mm -hmm. shot into three of them." And he said, "Well, I'll talk to the old man about it." So that night. Uh, I saw him later at Chow, and he says, yeah, the old man agrees. So I was assigned assistant S3 to uh, uh, Major Turner, Tex Turner. He retired as a colonel, full colonel. Okay. Now, for the people who don't know that, what does S3 mean? Oh, that's your operations. He does the planning and, and the stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like, they always just say there's pits. Your, your S1, 2, 3, and 4 pits, personnel, intelligence, training, supply. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. And the, the S3 is probably in combat the best, best one to be in because you're in the action there. Mm -hmm. And old Turner was, had been a guard, I think, for a West Point football team. And his blonde crew cut. Mm -hmm. He always had a cigar stuck in his mouth. And he always famous sayings was drive on, drive on, and out oh, fucking standing, <laughs> and that sort of thing. Good man to work for. Good guy to work for. He back you up. If you worked hard for him, he worked hard for you. He was a good guy. And then I would harass the old man. And who was the brigade commander at that point? Colonel Bradley. Mm -hmm. John uh, William Bradley. World War II guy. Oh, that's a funny story with him. He had been a sergeant in World War II, had done very well, and they sent him to West Point. You got to be pretty sharp. Well, he, I was sitting around him one night and uh, having a beer, and he says, uh, Yeah, I remember this goddamn little school from Iowa. Sons of bitches come up and kick our ass every year wrestling. I said, sir, that was my Uncle Paul. He coached that team. Mm -hmm. He did. And I thought he'd say, no shit. And he looked at me like, the you son of a bitch. He was still mad. <laughs> After all those years, that was back in the 40s. He, he, so I got up and I kindly mm -hmm. departed. Bradley was one hell of a good guy. He was, and I harassed him, and he finally got me a company. He got me over to the 506. Okay, and how long did you spend um, as assistant S3? I think about four months. Okay, and what was going on at that time? It was pretty quiet. Uh, there was just some local action. I think they were moving. The weather had changed from the wet season and it was starting to dry out, we could move up into the mountains. Mm -hmm. So that, that was primarily it. There was getting to be a little bit of a contact, but not much. Okay, uh, and so when did you uh, get your company? Uh, in, in late March of... Uh, 70. 70, thank you. And uh, 
I remember the weather was so bad that they couldn't get me out to the field for about four or five days. There was, uh, that reminds, remember the story about the guy, the man that never was? Well, this idiot had, had decided, had read the, uh, that book, and he decided nobody else knew, had ever read that book but him, obviously, because the army was just full of dummies. And I'm sitting in the S2 shop waiting for the chopper to take me out to the field, and had this first lieutenant who was the S2, and he was, he was a character. And this guy was telling me about this great idea he had that would probably win the war. Oh, really? and this guy played him like a violin. And he had this idea that we'll, we'll put this dead body in a jet plane with these phony papers in them, and then we'll crash it in there and do all this sort of stuff. And he played this guy on for a day and a half. And then he just sent his ass out the field to be a grunt. All right, this tape is about up, so we're going to pause right here. How many? All right, uh, in your story here, we've gotten to the point where uh, it's now late March of 1970, you've been assigned to your company. At this point, the battalion you're in, so 2nd Battalion, 506th Regiment, has started the operation. They've tried to set up the base mm -hmm. uh, on the hilltop that comes to be known as Ripcord, uh, and that had not worked when a Alpha Company went in there. Yeah. Uh, and then, now you join the unit. Um, okay, and when you get out to yeah, the unit... When I finally get out to the, uh, to the unit, they've had a casualty, a KIA, Point man was was killed, so they backload his body on the same chopper I went in on, mm -hmm. and so that it kind of escalated from there. And I remember the colonel coming in, or not, no, the replacement. I got all these replacements in, like eight mm -hmm. replacements in, and then April Fool's Day we were supposed to air assault Ripcord. I remember it was a beautiful, sunshiny day. I didn't anticipate a whole lot of problem going in there. And I had my company build up to a, a, a hundred people. That's more than I ever had. Most of the time it was around 75. And uh, we got the choppers come in, we get on there. Plus I've got all these people from battalion that are that are coming on the the artillery people that the battalion XO was there, uh, the signal people that were going to set up a fire base. So we get on there, and I remember standing there on top of the hill, and I hear a, an explosion. I look over there, and I see dust flying off. And I thought, what the hell? And I thought, because before you come in, they uh, choppers will come in and gun the place. And I thought, oh hell, somebody's round cooked off over there, rocket cooked off. What it was was the first mortar round that came in. He was for reference. Mm -hmm. He fired that in. And then, the, then the, as they say, the shit hit the fan after that. And we started, I started rock getting my people in the, in the perimeter around the fire base. And that's when the mortar rounds started really coming in. And then they started bringing, the colonel was up and the S3. Major Corningsbar, good man, and they started direct trying to get these mortars out, knocking out. That was just you'd hit one and three would open up over here, and it started getting casualties. So the Colonel, meaning the battalion commander, yeah, Colonel, Colonel Lucas. Lucas, yeah, Colonel Lucas, and Corningsbar was the S three, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember. Uh, Grabbing my, my best lieutenant had gone on R and R, Lieutenant Wallace, mm -hmm. Steve Wallace. So I had his platoon sergeant uh, with me, good man, young guy from Cal uh, from California. And he and I were running together to check his platoon. He veered off to check his platoon. I never saw him again alive. He got a mortar blew up right in front mm -hmm. of him, I guess. I ran over, somebody said he was hit, and I remember grabbing a medic and going over there and trying to and get him 
Revol. I left the medic there and I went mm -hmm. out and checked the rest of the company. And I lost uh, eight killed, I believe, seven or eight killed that day, and 20 some wounded. Some of the wounded uh, we didn't even evac evacuate to be, they were what we call light wounded, and it was too damn dangerous to uh, get them out of there. Because your chopper would come in and they'd just pepper the crap out of everything. So how far did you get in terms of bringing in the people and the equipment you were supposed to bring in that day? People, yes. Well, the, the Pathfinders came in. Half of them came in. Mm -hmm. Then they, they couldn't get the other half in. It's interesting, one of the Pathfinders was a kid I put through OCS. Uh, I, what is his name? He's dead now. But anyway, he, he and I had a, had a nice, he uh, says, you know, about a year and a half ago, I know a whole bunch of people would like to have seen you in this situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, as a matter of fact, one of the guys uh, in the ripcord, ripcord arena was the guy I put through OCS. That was a job I had before I went to right. the advanced course. Mm -hmm. Lovely job. That was, that was some ordeals with those kids, those characters. But the, they just kept up the, 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 the fire on us. They had everything pre-dug in. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody would get too much fire, then somebody over here would pick it up. They, they knew what the hell they were doing. And, uh, oh, let's see. And the chopper came in. They disabled the chopper. It set down. They just we just left it there. And I remember uh, at the beginning mainly I used to get all this interfering to be on the radio talking to my people or to talk to the colonel. And this guy breaks in. He says, "I want you to get out and get those mortars." Which one you want me to get? I got them at 360 degrees. And I was really getting pissed at this kind of mm -hmm. stupidity. It turns out that was the division commander. And the colonel heard this and he broke in and took, got, he was good about that. Mm -hmm. He got that situation cleared up. And, but, you know, from above, it looks like this floor. You know, only it was green. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, and later, uh, we walked from Rip Cord to where those mortar, some of those mortar positions were, it took us a half a day and there wasn't anybody fighting us in between those. So it, that would have been a... Okay. So as the day wears on, I mean, do they abandon the attempt to set up a base there or what happens? Yeah, it was just more or less survival. <laughs> and they realized, I think towards the end, towards night, that it was not going to work. And I got the order from the colonel to withdraw. And Ripcord was here, and there's another hill over here where I think A Company was. Mm -hmm. And we were told to withdraw over to there. And that, that, was, uh, that was a pretty hairy situation. We lined everybody up. We, we buried the dead. Uh, it got so bad there we had, uh, we were trying to backload uh, the dead out. And chopper came in, and of course every time a chopper came in, he'd start hitting us real hard. And I remember we loaded this one kid on in, a, in his bag, in a, in a body bag, mm -hmm. and the chopper took off, and the mortar rounds came in, and they threw his body out. That pissed me off so bad that I, I wanted to shoot, shoot that damn chopper, but of course mm -hmm. didn't. But the, 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 you know, because he, hell, he could have came, taken mm -hmm. that body with him. So we ended up throw, burying them in some old holes and stuff. Later they came in and got them out. Mm -hmm. Tried to police up all the ammunition and weapons that had been left laying around. Laid it over there by the, I think they tried to, they blew that up. Although later, months, months later, we found my, ar my artillery FO was killed. Mm -hmm. We found his weapon in a cache, in an NVA cache. And uh, we 
we were told to withdraw over to that hill. So we lined everybody up, and you kept a hold of the guy's rucksack in front mm -hmm. of you, and they'd fire illumination round. And the guy in front would memorize the next 15, 10, 15, 20 feet, whatever he could mm -hmm. do. Illumination would go out, and you'd walk over there. you just wait for somebody to open up on you. And you had to go down the side of the hill first, right? Yeah, down this, across this saddle and over to A Company. Mm -hmm. And how long did that take? Oh, it seemed like forever. But I remember calling A Company, getting a, the company commander on the phone. And I said, would you fan, send out a contact team to guide us in? I don't want to walk in on some jittery machine gunner and get myself all ripped up, have these boys all shot up, and he refused to do it. I have no idea why that son of a bitch wouldn't do that, but I did not think much of him at the time. Still don't really, but all right. a long time. And so, but you do safely make contact eventually. Hmm? You do yes, get there. Yes, we did walk in on the, we got there safely, Got every, nobody fired us up, thank God. And that was the damnedest, damnedest night. Of, and then once you're there, now um, I guess my understanding is sort of the weather got bad, they couldn't get you out. Yeah, they, we got, I had orders that night to go ahead and sign, get my people ready for, to be lifted out by helicopter mm -hmm. the next day. Then the fog came in and we couldn't do it. So we were told to move from there down to D Company. Rawlinson, and uh, it was it was really thick. There wasn't any chance of that that crap moving moving out. So we moved down. I still had walking wounded with me, and the hill was mountain was was pretty dang steep. We were hanging from tree to tree in some cases. Got down at the bottom. <laughs> Got down at the bottom where it's fairly level. I trip on a root. My rifle comes up and knocks my teeth out, which was handy in a way, because I smoked in those days, and I would just push the cigarette up there, and and I could use both hands and still smoke, which that my wife wants me to get rid of this tooth. I said, no, that's my army tooth. I can't, I can't get rid of that tooth. <laughs> Uh, so we, we had a hard time getting contact with D Company. And did you have supply problems? Yeah, we got, finally got into D Company. And I remember going in to meet Rollinson. Rollinson, if he stopped for five minutes, his RTO was making him coffee. He, he was a good, I wish you could not have met him. He's dead now, but he was quite a character. I carried a shotgun. I was a Winchester. Anyway, I get in there with him and I said to the NCO, I said, contact his, get hold of his first sergeant and set, set up our, our security. He said, bullshit, you guys are dead, tired, we'll take care of security tonight. He was just completely the opposite attitude of, mm -hmm. of the guy up there in A Company. Yeah. Now, I mean, I've talked to some guys in B Company and one of them had mentioned that when you got to A Company, they didn't want to share any food with you. I wouldn't doubt that either. And that you didn't have food for several days as you were trying to get over to where D Company was. Yeah, we, they, yeah, because we didn't come in there with a lot of rations because we thought we were going to get it. I remember once we we separated from uh, D Company the next day, uh, guys fighting over cans of uh, jam and mm -hmm. cheese and stuff like that. And, well. Bob Judd claims that I broke up a fight or an argument and took it away and kept it myself. <laughs> I, I don't know if I kept that my I kind of doubt it I, myself. I was But Bob Judd's a good guy, so. All right. So it's kind of difficult there for a few days. Yeah. The, it was interesting that we called in about that and, and they said, well, we have an opportunity here. Yeah, but Air Force has come up with a new technique that they can drop a pallet of sea rations on your location if you'll just give us your eight-digit coordinates. I said, I can't see past my hand. 
how in the shit am I going to give you my eight-digit coordinates? Well, we'll do it anyway. Give us a guess. Hell, we never even heard the airplane. Mm -hmm. So this is probably a, a, a pallet of sea ration still hanging up in the triple canopy up there in I or somewhere. No, I don't know. The NBA might have gotten it by now. Well, maybe. I hope they got the indigestion. Yeah. All right. So now, do they eventually evacuate you and take you back to base, or what do they do with you? No, we roamed around for a while. We finally got, I think we got resupplied. And then I got a call uh, saying, we're going to take you guys back to the rear. Mm -hmm. So I called the platoons and we all got together and, and got airlifted back to the rear. And got back and the first sergeant had, had a great first sergeant and turned the company over to him and he took care of them until uh, we got ready to go back out and then I don't know how long we got we stayed in the rear probably wasn't too long they didn't like us to stay in the rear it was kind of like they were afraid we'd do something mm -hmm. which when we got back to the rear we did but some of the guys I didn't know about what those little those little shits did until we started meeting, mm -hmm. and then they started talking about all the crap they did. Tolson and Judd were prime examples. There's that. What are you going to do to a guy? Send him to the field? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't have got along without those two anyway. All right. So, uh, pretty soon though, you do have to go back out into the field again. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and so this is now, ladder, let's see, this is in April. Have they, do you go out after they set up, the C Company sets up record, or do you go out I don't know. I, I, see, that was April Fool's Day. Yeah. And so I suppose we stayed back two or three days at the most. And so it would have been in first or second week of April, we mm -hmm. went back out mm -hmm. and we just started doing our normal patrolling. They gave us an AO to, to work in and we started doing that. Okay. And what was going, so this is sort of latter, second half of April into May, you're doing this, just patrolling around? Yeah, we, we kept finding signs. We didn't make a lot of contact, but we found a lot of signs of construction, you know, building bunkers mm -hmm. and, and little hooches and places like that. I can remember we were just, Tolson and I were just uh, reminiscing about that. I said, I can still remember him. We <clears throat> come into an area and we we're going to set up for the night, uh, NDP. And, and I remember him saying, sir, look over there and how he was behind me, but he pointed his arm like this, look over there and there was this whole array of bunkers. And the next day we moved into that and it was all, they were all empty. They had gone in there and their construction people had gone in there and built all this stuff up. And once you find a set of bunkers like that, do you, what do you do with them? We call back. Usually the artillery then works them over because we didn't have anything to tear them up. Those little buggers could build a, a strong bunker. I remember finding a dead mortar round and trying to uh, get it to blow up inside the bunker. To, I couldn't even get the thing to blow up. All right. Uh, now, how long did you stay out in the field, do you think, there? Hmm. Gee, I can't. Uh, some of those guys in the company, before I took it over, had been in the company, had been in the field 100 days. Mm -hmm. They were out there a lot. I got in there, those guys looked like a ragged mess. Uniforms were torn up, and their hair was long, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and of course Tolson's did. did. He tell you about how I, mean, I made him shave every day. Did he complain about that? He oh, didn't mention that. He always does that. He always puts in my book. He was a close shave, and because mm -hmm. I, it was a matter of two things: discipline, and if you keep your face clean, you don't get an infection if you get hit. If you got hit whiskers, and you get hit in the face it's pretty much you're going to get infected. Mm -hmm. So I'd make them shave every day. Some companies, they didn't, they looked like a bunch of bums, like Willie and Joe from mm -hmm. World War II. 
So I, I thought that was, I wasn't trying to play Patton or anything, but. And when you were out in the field, uh, did you have standard uh, operating procedure for moving the units around? When you're going from point A to point B, how do you do it? Normally, uh, the platoons operated separately. Mm -hmm. And I would move my company headquarters from platoon to platoon, depending on, you know, stay a few days with one, move one to the other. And they would set up and then they would start making clover leaf patrols around it. At night, I remember I studied uh, the uh, in Malaysia when they fought the uh, the uh, communists in Malaysia. The British had a, what they called harboring drill. I think the uh, Gurkhas did it, and you would set up in position, and then you'd send a sweep around all the way, and you were all the way around, and you'd be at a hundred percent alert until full dark. Because very seldom do they hit you in full dark if they're not around you to start with. Mm -hmm. And so we'd, we'd say the board is set. And then in the morning, before it got light, you'd be at 100% again. And invariably, once in a while, somebody would trip a flare. And he would take his helmet off and put it over the flare which would immediately melt his helmet liner. So until we got a new helmet liner in, he had to wear his helmet, which fit him like a loose bell. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was our procedure. We never got ambushed. Okay. Now, did you get into any firefights or run into NVA which you back? Yeah, the, uh, the people that I were with never never particularly did, but some of the other platoons did. They they ran into a group that were heading for Ripcord, and they got into a pretty good firefight. And those guys always uh, used an RPG. It seemed like the first damn thing they threw at you was an RPG. And then we got, when was Hill 805? Oh, that was in July. Wasn't it? Well, there's the, the, the a couple of different things happen in, in, on A805. I mean, you're on, you were on, well, I, you eventually are on Rip, well, your unit's on top of Ripcord, but that's actually after you switch out, right? So 805 is earlier than, so. Well, no, we were on 805, and then we walked from 805 to Ripcord. Yeah. Okay. That was in July, early early part of July. Early in July. Okay. That's when I got hit by lightning. On, on. Okay. So so talk about Hill 805 then. Well, we got on we got on there. We air assaulted it into there. The old man called us in, and I remember I wanted Wallace's platoon to come in first because he was the best platoon leader, mm -hmm. and he was trying to get to a place where he could get to the helicopters, and he had a hell of a climb, so he didn't make it right away. We all came in. I remember st sitting there on this hill, and I could see 805 over there, and I'm watching it through my binoculars, and they got choppers up there. And I could see that chopper come in, and he'd fire it up, and I'd hear, click, 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 and that's AK. And he'd come back and fire it up, click, 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 and that little son of a bitch was up there. He they, some of those, I gotta give them credit, they were a gutsy bunch. So there's like one Vietnamese guy with an AK-47 shooting was, back at the helicopter. Somebody, but there was somebody up there. They might have been like rice, rats, once you mm -hmm. see one, then you know there's more than. Mm -hmm. So we get up, we have to air assault, 805 is here where we landed, right here. So this guy up here is shooting right down on us. Mm -hmm. And that did not make me feel very confident. And I come in on uh, oh, one of the first or two or three choppers. I didn't want to come in on the first one. And I came in because I didn't trust the platoon leader on this in this platoon. So I came in with his platoon. We come to a skidding stall and everybody unasses the thing immediately. And this guy up here, he's firing away. And I, the chopper. A lot of these guys were arguing over who killed who. I didn't care who killed the little bastard as long as he was dead. But they found, we found out later, 
got up the top, there was an RPG up there with the round jammed in it. Mm -hmm. And if he'd have fired down on that and got one of those choppers, it would have, because that, that landing zone was only big enough for one. Mm -hmm. And I took uh, two casualties, Rubson got hit in the arm and, oh, what's the kid's name, he's from Alabama, got hit in the back. Because he was, he was out this way, looking this way, and the guy up here shot him in the back. And uh, then I had to, I was on the far side of the LZ, and somebody yelled for me over on this side. And my radio operator is a guy named uh, Brian Reppy. Hell of a good guy. Hell of a, I wish he was here. You'd enjoy talking to him. From Proctor, Minnesota, I think it was. And he had, he's, we're still, we still chat with each other to this day. And we came, I come a darting across the LZ. Normally I would have gone away around because little Clark was still up on that hill mm -hmm. shooting. And Rappy always kept a good distance between the two of us. And we come over dancing across there and this guy opens up and it fires right over the top of my head, right in between us. And Rappy says, just like in the movies. And both of us bail out this way. And I, and I yell, Rappy, you okay? He says, yeah. And I said, well, come on over, I need the radio. He says, fuck you, sir. <laughs> He still, he still thinks that he could have got court martial over that. <laughs> so he finally makes it over and gets in. And we stay there until Wallace's group come in, comes in and we put suppressive fire down for him to get in. And so Wallace comes in, see Reuben shot, had been shot through the arm, we evacuated him. The other platoon leader I did I wouldn't trust with anything. He, he wasn't a bad guy, he just incompetent. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have anybody to go up that hill. So finally Wallace comes in and he goes up the hill and he finds they've evacuated then. Mm -hmm. And the guy's laying dead. So then we go up there and set up and I leave Wallace's platoon down on the LZ because there wasn't enough room for us all up there. And uh, they hit us that night. I can remember I had a foxhole dug over here, and I had there was a big log right here, and I'm sitting over here, laying over there, and an RPG goes over our heads. It was very colorful. Mm -hmm. All this, all this stuff flying out of the back of it, and I levitated. I know I didn't get up. I levitated from that right into that hole. And uh, the guys knew that was a probe. They, they were probing to find out where all your people are at, where your heavy weapons at, mm -hmm. your automatic weapons at. And these kids were good. My kids were good. They, I still call them kids, they're 60s. Uh, he, uh, they fired back with, with uh, grenades and that sort of thing, but no direct fire weapons, no automatic weapons. Mm -hmm. So they didn't learn where everybody was. And this one kid, he was he was new. I think he was from New York. He was kind of a mouthy little shit, but he was all right. And he was out on outpost. And he comes running back in. And somebody says, what the hell are you doing back in here? He says, well, ain't I supposed to come in? No, you're not supposed to have been called it. So he runs right back out. So he, so he had he had his he was a, he had his kill and he said he was a good boy. Mm -hmm. So we sat there and got got that little thing taken care of. And then I think was it either that night or the next night that was it C Company. Yeah, I think the next night was was Hill Nine O Two. Yeah, got got wiped out. That that I hate to speak ill of the dead. But that company commander should not have done what he did. He had worked with the Vietnamese for too long and got their lazy ways. And he set up a hammock on the top of that damned hill. He didn't set up his proper security. He didn't set up wire. 
if he could have called in for concertina or anything. He could have put Tanglefoot out, anything. If there's three things that are important in combat, it's security, security, security. And he didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And he also was staying in the same place two nights in a row, which yes, wasn't normal. That wasn't his fault entirely. I think he was told. He was ordered that. to, yeah. But the rest of that, and well, that RPG hit him. Yeah. The it hammock on top of the crest of a hill was just. Yeah, he was silhouetted up. Yeah. Now, Smoker was with it. He took a couple of them. He got a couple of those guys. Yeah. Well, that was, uh, that's the case when we've talked to a fair number of people now who were on that hill, you know, piecing all of that stuff together. But it was a very position that's essentially overrun, and they they fight them off eventually. It's yeah. not easy. But that one. That shouldn't have happened. No. That shouldn't have happened. That the guy had had listened and remembered to his training. He listened and, and remembered that training. You, sometimes you got to be a, a hard ass son of a bitch to, and and people you can't go out there and, and think you're going to be the most popular guy in the block. You, you got to go out and kick some butt sometimes, and and at least I like I say I'd rather have a whole bunch of live enemies than a bunch of dead friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because those dead live enemies sometimes will get a little older and think. He's not such a son of a bitch to start with. All right, so at this point, now, when when in this sequence then do you get hit by lightning? Uh, we were a bit told to pull off of 805. What was left of Charlie Company was going to take over, I believe. I think they may have gone there first and then left, because they get re have to get rebuilt pretty much. Yeah, who, I forgot who took over the company. But anyway, they were coming in, and as my company was pulling out, and I was making sure, I was staying up here to make sure we got everybody off right, and uh, the point man get, ran into something and started, started firing. So uh, Andresen, Aaron Andresen, who is my FO, very good man, retired professor, up in either Montana or Mont Montana or Idaho, I forgot which. He and I were behind a tree, and we'd run our tall antennas up, so I could talk to the people, and he could talk to artillery. And the, mon the monsoons were coming in. I mean, they come in quick. But you're not really concerned with the weather point like that. And lightning strikes the tree we're behind, and comes down. I was the one closest to the tree. So it comes down my antenna more than it does Aaron's. And Reppy says it threw me about 15 feet through the air and down the hill. And I was laying there, he says, you're kicking and, and flinching and all the entangled up in the cord. He says, blew the hell out of the radio. He wasn't more, he was more concerned about his radio. Mm -hmm. than and and uh, it really rung my bell. And I, I, as much as I could, I couldn't keep a train of thought. So I finally I told called Wallace up and told him he had it for the night. And I, uh, then I, we got orders to uh, go back to the fire base. And as we got back there, then I got a lecture from the colonel and the chaplain that this was possibly a sign. Now, did you have to go to um, the hospital, or were you okay again? No. I went to Doc Harris mm -hmm. on the fire base. He looked in my ear because I had the radio ear. Yep, blew the, you blew the eardrum out. And there's two artillery batteries on top of that hill, and they're firing away. And I said, well, what do I do, Doc? And he says, stay away from loud noises. Kaboom. <laughs> I said, yeah, right. He says, well, that's the only thing I can tell you, because that's the only thing you can do. Later on, I wounded, I blew this one up. That's why I got my... Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, does your... So you went back up to the fire base, and then do you do security there, or do you get evacuated? No, we got... Uh, we pulled... Uh, we were... Took well, that's right, because you take over... 
This is now July, so your yeah. company takes over security. Yeah, and then I was moved to uh, to S3. The colonel told me that when we were on the ground, uh, Raleigh came up and told me, he says, Hey, Bill, I heard that uh, we're going to lose our companies. I said, What? Yeah, I said, We better go talk to the old man. So we went and saw the colonel. He said, Tall, Tall Raleigh, yeah, you're going to be the S4, but not right away. Williams, you're going to be my new S3. Uh, uh, Corningsbauer is being sent to division. Mm -hmm. Stupidest damn laws that rules they had in the world. Because he was an excellent S3. I really enjoyed working for that man. He knew what he was doing and he had a, a demeanor about him that was, you liked him and you understood him and he wasn't talking down to you or anything like that. We still uh, hear from his wife in the once in a while. But, but they rotate officers at least every six months. Oh, had so. to. It was just, yeah. here we are in the middle of a damn battle and mm -hmm. these idiots are doing that. I don't think, I wonder if the Army still does that stupid stuff. But I imagine they got their own other, other, other categories. Hurtures, yeah. So I, I moved up uh, to top of the hill where the S3 stays with the colonel in the bunker there. And... What's his name? Fuzzface down here. What's his Ben, 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 uh, haven't you talked to him yet? What, we in Harrison? Ben, no, not Ben. Uh, the the... Ben, well, he's got the full beard and the long Oh, hair. oh. Yeah, you're right. Now, now, now you're affecting me because, yeah, I interviewed him last year. Uh, but yeah, so you have, so you've got, and he's now replacing you. He's taking yeah. over your company. Yeah. Okay, but he'll, he'll it'll come back to us. Yeah. Don't worry. But anyway, yes. So, but you're you're so you're uh, you're up on Ripcord, and actually B Company is still there because they're yeah. B providing. Company is is the infantry company on the hill. I've changed to S three now. I got Corning I got Corning's Bar's job, and he's gone. And then Ben's taken over B Company. Mm -hmm. He had been headquarters company commander, right. and. I remember going around with the colonel all over the place, trying to find, get to know what the hell I was doing and so forth. And uh, well, every night at five, uh, five o'clock, seventeen hundred, we had the staff meeting. And of course, the bad guys down there, yep, yep, let's start. And so we were getting ready to have the staff meeting. The old man was gone somewhere. I forgot which where. But we were all in the getting ready to go in the talk. Had the board up, and remember the uh, signal officer, Lieutenant Darling. Uh, every night he would get up and he would give the stitch situation for the combo, and he would write a number in the corner. And that was the number of days he had until he went to see his wife in Hawaii, and he never made it. He was killed, I think he had three days to go. And the chopper got shot down and they they finally found the bodies and put them in a bag in a sling underneath a helicopter and I remember them flying away and something went wrong and that thing came loose and they dropped him. I don't know if they ever found the poor devils or not. Mm -hmm. Describe a little bit sort of what happens over the course of the time when you're on the hilltop now. Because um, this is when the enemy bombardment starts to get really heavy. Um, you know, they were hitting primarily up, up of course, on, towards the top of the, where the headquarters was. Mm -hmm. And the guy, the infantry guys down the, down the side weren't, weren't getting a whole lot, but they were getting some. Uh, they were getting some probes at night. Nobody ever got through a wire. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anybody ever explained the the defensive setup that. that well, Captain Vasquez explained it, and a couple of the B Company guys have talked about yeah. it. But basically, you had sort of multiple sets of barbed wire yeah. and, and fuel gas and all of that. And there was one time in which in which uh, the, well, a Chinook came in, mm -hmm. 
to bring in ammunition in for the artillery. And as he was coming in, he was silhouetted, and they had an art anti aircraft gun down here, and they just shot shot him out of the air, and he crashed. And all his fuel tanks cracked open, and it ran right into the ammunition dump of the artillery and trapped the crew chief inside alive. And they couldn't get him out because he was pinned in real bad. I remember the colonel and I went up there and tried to get him out, and the colonel finally ordered everybody off the top of that hill because he knew the stuff was going to start cooking off. And it blew for like seven, eight hours. I took a, a radio, because it blew all the antennas down from the talk, and I took the radio over to one side and was relaying from there back to the rear. But well, the, the colonel had brought this squad in, or what was left of a platoon in, that had gotten chopped up real bad to bring them in and give them some rest. Well, when all this stuff started cooking off, this kid wakes up in a just a dead ass panic, and he was wearing GI shorts and a, his GI shirt, no hat, nothing, no no shoes, and he runs and clears all that. He cleared what three rows of concertina tangle foot, about a six or eight foot hog wire fence with concertina on the top three rows of concertina on the other side, clears all that, and runs down the hill. And, uh, and I'm standing over to, this happened over here, and I'm standing over to this side, and it might have been Tolson, I don't know. One of them says, hey, Captain William, there's a gook outside the wire. I think Tolson said that it was him, yeah. And I, he says, what are you doing? I said, well, kill a son of a bitch. And so they, they, there was a bunch of big rocks out there, and they fire, started firing up. I suppose Tolson gave a better description than I can. They just shot the shit out of that place. And pretty soon you see this guy going. And it's this kid. And he came to one of the reunions a few years ago. I don't know if you ever were there then. And his I think he was a school teacher or something, and his wife was there, and she just about, I mean, she, that poor lady turned really white. She found out what her, and I talked to him, and I said, when did you realize that you were in Indian country? He says, I ran down that hill, he says, and I came up to a bowl of rice and a fire, and I said, that ain't our cook. <laughs> So then he came around. He was all cut up from the wire and stuff, but otherwise it really wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. I can still remember that, and I thought, we're just going to blow this guy away easy. This is an easy kill. And mm, not so much. Thank God we didn't get him. Yeah. Now once the Chinook crashes, that's July 18, and by this time it's getting problematic staying on the hill, or at least we never thought about it really. Mm -hmm. I never did. Well, the evacuation order comes a few days later. Well, I wasn't there then. That's okay. when I had my dental appointment. All right, explain that. Well, I was, they were at the staff meeting again. Mm -hmm. And uh, Doc says, Doc Harris says, this is what, because I have no memory of this. And Doc says that, hey, there's a bunch of guys standing outside waiting around the, the, the talk, they're going to send a, the gooks are going to fire it up pretty soon, they're going to send a round in here. So I go up there and tell them to, I, I assume I said it in a very gentlemanly way, to get their asses out of there because they, you know, and I can just see those NBA down there saying, hurry, 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 those guys are moving, those guys are moving. And got them all down, and uh, I got it, and uh, see, what is it? What is Tuna? Is Tar Charlie Tuna, we called him Charlie Tuna. He was a lieutenant then. He's a 
with played guard for West Point. Mm -hmm. He's from Green Bay, Wisconsin. That's my problem. I can't remember names. Right. I can describe things. But anyway, he got hit, light, light shrapnel balloons, and I got hit, and it blew me down the stairs. And Doc was there. Dr. Harris came mm -hmm. over and it had cut my va juggler vein and crushed in the back of my head, punctured this lung, then I got a bunch of other shrapnel wounds. Never got anything above my, yeah I did. Got a slice taken out of my left cheek. Mm -hmm. It's still there. The, ch the piece of metal is still there. And I, Doc stuck all this uh, gauze in there and stuck to stop the bleeding and and uh, they got Rempe and uh, U Uvi ha uh, 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 Meyer, yeah. you know Uvi? Yeah. <laughs> and they say about Uvi, he learned to whisper in a sawmill. Can you believe that? <laughs> he's, a good, he's a good fellow. But anyway, they took me out and threw me on the helicopter. And I had just bought this Browning 9 millimeter automatic from a helicopter pilot. Mm -hmm. And with a couple of magazines and I gave it, supposedly, Ubi says I gave it to him and he gave it to somebody else mm -hmm. and it disappeared into the mist. But he didn't get it back again. No, obviously not. The only thing I ever got back was my GI belt, and it was cut in half. I didn't get my watch back. I didn't get my dog tags back. I didn't get, what else was there I lost? Nothing really valuable. Mm -hmm. So uh, how long were you out? Five days. When you, woke up, when you woke up, where were you? I was in the in a bed, Charlie Med. I was in a bed with air conditioning, white sheets, and tubes running out of every orifice in my body and a couple that I didn't know I had. And a Red Cross lady standing up and I thought, boy, look up at her. This is an old woman. She was probably fifty. <laughs> and she says, uh, can I write a letter home for you? I said, because my jaw was wired shut, because it was broken. And I told her yes, if she would, and I remember thinking that I had recited this really long letter to my mom. And I finally got, when I got back home and read it, it was just a little sheet of paper like mm -hmm. that. And then the nurse came up and says, no, nah, time for you to go night-night. And that was the last I remember. And then another time, this really nice looking, and my eyes were all screwed up too, and I wore glasses in. Of course, the glasses were gone, and I was seeing double. And this nice looking redheaded nurse comes down, and she looks at me and she says, You don't remember me, do you? And I said, No, I'd like to. And she got this very sad look on her face and left. And the Red Cross lady was back. She says, well, you know, there's three nurses up there in surgery come down to see you every day. I says, what the hell did I do to deserve that? And I never saw them again. I guess they said they used to call me the bald-headed Glenn Campbell. I don't know if I was playing the guitar or what. I had no idea what the hell I was telling, but it must have been good. Mm -hmm. But then I, I got uh, moved from there to Camp Drake, Japan for three weeks. And the good old army, you can tell how sick you are by two things. The color of your pajamas and if you you're, they make your bed. If they make your bed, you're really in bad shape. And if your pajamas are dark blue, you're serious. But if they're light blue, you're in, you're on, you're on recovery. Mm -hmm. 
and we were in this great big warehouse type thing. And in the center, with this side was the bad guy, and these were the convalescents, and the latrines were in the middle. And I remember staggering into the latrine and trying to sit down on the commode, and it took me about five minutes to get up because I was so stiff and sore. And this, we had this one nurse, big old gal, blonde, and she was from up in Dakota somewhere. And I think she had about six brothers, I don't know. Because she had no problem. She comes just storming through because it was close, you know. Mm -hmm. And me and this other guy, ah, don't get that boy, something. I won't stay long. You know? And we had this kid in there, my name was George. He was about six, two or three, big kid. And he'd been in an armored vehicle that got blown up, and it, they said he bruised his brain. That's the only thing I know. But they finally let George, and George only could say medic and nurse for about a week. And then one day, this other kid who was getting a plate put in his head, we were in the latrine, the other kid was shaving, getting ready to shave, I think we both were. There comes George, they were going to let George shave by himself. And he shaves pretty good. Then he lifts his head up to shave under here and he just out like a light. And this other kid and I, who are not near as big as George combined, were standing there holding him up and yelling for the nurse. She comes in, grabs him, takes him in, and throws him in bed. And I used to have these nightmares every night. And I'd wake up and I'd think like, I can't find my rifle. And I remember walking up the nurse's station and telling the nurse, I can't find my rifle. And she's, oh, shut up and go to bed. Okay, so I just get up, go in, go. That was all I needed. So finally I kept saying to myself, you're safe, you're in the hospital, you're not going to in combat anymore, and that, that was the last of that. And then they moved me over into the convalescent board, and I started getting mail from home. And, uh, you know, the, the, the opinion of the people back in the States a lot was anti-war. But you know, I was from a little town in Iowa in the Midwest, I, and my bed would be covered. I'd come back from some sort of... Uh, treatment and my bed would be covered with get well cards. Mm -hmm. And that lasted for three or four days until the whole town finally did that. And, and I stayed there three weeks and they put me on a plane to, were going to put me on a plane to the States, but then the Air Force said, no, he can't go because his jaw's wired shut with metal. He's got to be able to open his mouth in case the plane crashes. So then I had to go in there and get my jaw rewired and they put rubber bands in there and gave me a little pair of scissors that I put in my pocket and so I could fly on their airplane. And then they took me and flew me for, and we landed in the Philippines. And I went to get chow they told me to go and get chow, and you go to that officer's club over there. And they gave me Jello. And I couldn't eat Jello because you can't get it through your teeth. About six months later, I get the bill for that Jello from that officer's club in the Philippines. And I get to Travis Air Force Base. And they send me to the, they take me over to this, this hospital. And they say, don't get in the bed. Sit in the chair, don't get in the bed, because if you, you're going to get moved out of here pretty soon. If you get in that bed, we've got to remake it. So I'm sitting in the chair. And here comes this little Red Cross girl, pretty girl, about my age at that time. And she says, you've got one free phone call for any place in continental United States. I said, really? Okay. I'm talking like, like mm -hmm. that. And she said, where would you like to call? And I said, Wampalo, Iowa. 
And she says, you're kidding me. A lot of people say that and they say, ain't no such place. Mm -hmm. I spent the summer there last year with Patty Jagger, girl I went to high school with. She knew where it was and she knew some of the people there. Mm -hmm. So she calls and she talks to my mother and tells her I'm back in the States because all I can do is mumble. Mm -hmm. And then they finally f take me to, uh, how the hell did I get, I, I went to, to California they took me to that hospital to uh, Letterman, mm -hmm. and let's see, I got into Letterman and I could lay in my hospital bed, look out to Alcatraz. Indians had just taken over Alcatraz mm -hmm. and set the light on. And then uh, while I was there, they had, uh, they had a f forest fire, that's right, burned down a bunch of houses. And then they had rains and it had a mudslide. And then two ships collided under the Golden Gate Bridge full of oil. And this other guy and I, we used to escape out of the hospital all the time. And we went down there to watch people clean that up. And where was it? Oh, yeah, he and I, this other guy, and his name was Williams too, and he was in for some sort of surgery. And we had the Williams Couth and Culture Hour every night where we had one of the nurses bribed to bring in three bottles of wine every night. And then we had had another guy, and he would drink it with us. We'd, we'd keep the, uh, the wine chilled in the bowl in the toilet and stuff. And then was your jaw still wired shut at this point? Yeah. Okay. Everybody's jaw was wired shut. They, you, we could understand each other, but nobody else could understand. We were down at, the, at this little lounge one day talking, and we said, you know, these California people, they get used to anything. The guy could have an ear in the middle of his head, and nobody would think about it. So Pete, the other guy, had a buddy who was a dentist. He got, the, the dentist got his clerk ear mold made out of the same stuff that he made gums out of. It all looked like it had been boiled. It's all red and you can see these little veins in it. So I was the only guy who was follically challenged. And so that next morning we taped the, the ear in the middle of my head and we wrapped my head in gauze and all this stuff and stole a wheelchair and just went through the hospital. And the best place was to get get people trapped in the in the elevator with you, because then they couldn't get away. And they would talk to you, and you go, "What? What?" Because that ear look, <laughs> and people always try to. They, and then we they we had to go down and see the doctor, and the doctor said, "Oh, you dumb shit." <laughs> and the best thing I ever did, though, well, on Thursdays we had to go to be examined by all the oral surgeons and they would bring in this one guy who was the epitome of all the oral surgeons in the area, this old guy, Dr. Moose. And they'd lay in this chair and they'd all stand around and look at you and I just hated that. And they, and they said, evidently said to Dr. Moose, this guy has been problem. Could you please give him some benefit of your great intellect? So Dr. Moose looks at me and he says, Young man, don't you know the situation is similar to as if you were in a prisoner of war camp? You just must resign yourself to the fact that that's your situation. I said, he said, what, do you, what would you do if you were a prisoner of war? I said, I had escaped out of this goddamn place two months ago. And then he just get, loses it completely and starts screaming and telling me to get out. That, that was my greatest victory in the hospital. Though. So how long did you spend in that hospital? Eight and a half months. Oh boy. I had, I had uh, two periods where uh, they let me go home. I got married on one of them. Was your job wired shut then too? No, but I could wire it up. I could get it this far. Okay. When my wife cut the uh, the wedding cake, she had to 
cut it about like that, and then just shove it in. In a little town called Akron, Alabama, I'd met her while I was at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. But I've, I've almost got all the grit out of her until somebody from Alabama calls, and then the alls and mm -hmm. that stuff come back. Oh, we've been married. We'll be married 45 years in February. All right. So when are you finally out of the hospital officially? Well, now that's the other thing. That sorry ass doctor. Dr. Frost, I forget his name, Jack Frost. The day I get cleared to leave the hospital, he yanks a tooth. I can finally eat real food. And for, for all that time, I was on liquid diet. Mm -hmm. And the worst diet food I had was liquid fish and liquid beets. Ugh. Yeah. And one time, all we got was four bowls of mashed potatoes, liquid mashed potatoes. But I forgot the date I got out of there. You wouldn't think, it. but I know, I know one thing, you had an earthquake. That was the last thing California did to me that they had an earthquake. I got the hell out of there. And then I got assigned to, uh, to uh, Fort Carson, Colorado. Okay. Now, you just about killed off hour number two here. Jeez, that must be a real blabber. Well, we are recording again now. Oh, uh, I'm back on? You are back on. So we basically got you to the end of your stay in Letterman Hospital. Um, and you finally... I'm a newly married man. Mm -hmm. And you're sent off to Fort Carson, Colorado. Yeah. All right. What do you do there? I'm assistant S3 Brigade. And I have a buddy I went to college with. He was a year ahead of me. He was in, in the same brigade, and he gets me a job. And... Have, uh, it was a completely different type of army because we were, wasn't the, the old hard army where you're getting up at five o'clock in the morning and doing that and you had a lot of times you didn't, you got off at uh, late and you had to be there early and the, with this and it was, you got there late and got off early and you had training holidays and we had a whole bunch, all these kids, soldiers coming back from Vietnam that had maybe three months mm -hmm. left in the service. Yeah, it's kind of like herding a bunch of cats. So we tried to come up, remember we had uh, this major I worked for, had been he was an old SF guy too. And we we came up with adventure duty training, mm -hmm. training. And one winter we worked out, the three of us worked out a thing where it's called Stride the Divide, the Continental Divide, Colorado. And we planned it out, proposed it to the division commander, which we never thought would ever say okay, and who said, hell yes, correct. And we put it out to the, he, we had to put it out to the entire division uh, for volunteers, and we got 24 volunteers. And, uh, this was to walk from New Mexico to Wyoming on the Continental Divide. And uh, I volunteered, I was the ass officer. I had three mules and I got the guys to volunteer, two men per mule. And I had a Louisiana Cajun with an Irish name. I had a uh, a guy from back east who could steal anything. And then I had a kid from Webblow, Colorado, who could make furniture. And uh, that was about, and myself. And we, we tug, trained with those mules, and we walked from uh, New Mexico, state line, we trained first. We climbed Pikes Peak a couple times and and trotted around and did some things. And mainly, it was I didn't think they were going to let us do it the whole way, but they did. And we even had resupply points along the way. 
and it was it was the best time. I, oh man, I, when we finally cleared up, cleared the the Wyoming border, it was uh, everybody was kind of sad. We two guys had to drop out. One guy's girlfriend decided to get pregnant, and and another guy forgot. He, oh, he got sick. Mm -hmm. Got sick. So how long did this take? Fifty some days. Okay. Fifty some days. And the, my buddy from uh, the advanced course, Robbie Robinson, was there, and he was the best map guy in, ever. He play, we walked three days in the rain, and he came right out on the benchmark. I couldn't have done that in a hundred years. But I see him about every year. He's a train nut, and he comes up and he stays with us for a few days while there's a, some sort of train. Mm -hmm. Thing and uh, going on in Colorado, but that was it. Was the adventure of that? The beauty of that was just I took, and my wife still bitches at me. I took six pictures the whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you drag a mule up a hill or up a mountain, the last thing I was interested in was taking a picture. And. The food, we, I remember we'd get supplied with food and they'd have an army mess truck out there. I remember one day they didn't, and we were all on rations and a half because of the tremendous calorie mm -hmm. burning you were doing. And uh, I ate half a dozen pancakes, five eggs, some sausage, I've forgotten which. And by noon you're hungry again. Mm -hmm. you know. But then, then I was uh, had a had a new son born. Though so when I got home, there had and my wife and my kid were there. The general gave us a week off, which pissed a lot of people off in the division. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was the last thing, the last time, the last big thing. After that, then my health started to go down, and I developed. Uh, yeah, I was diagnosed with epilepsy, psychomotor epilepsy, because of the, the head wound. Mm -hmm. And uh, they put me, they retired me on uh, a medical retirement. And since then I've developed, uh, well, let's see, I had Bell's palsy, I had, I had thyroiditis, my thyroid's going to hell, and and now I've got a, a blood disease, which uh, I've been fighting for years, and a couple other things that are some kind of minor compared to what the other things. All right. And then did you go and find a new line of work after you got out of the Army? No, I was retired, and the, I was given Social Security due to unemployability. Because mm -hmm. I can't stand uh, to be around people too long or too. I know she noticed that with Phil, probably. <laughs> and uh, that's. Uh, I live out, uh, we live out in the mountains. And my wife is very understanding about that, although she does travel a lot herself. Uh, but I remember. Fred Spaulding and his wife Mickey came out. Mickey's from Korea originally, mm -hmm. just a lovely lady. She asked, we were walking back from my barn, and uh, she says, Bill, why do you live so far away? And I said, because I couldn't get any further. And Fred had to explain that to her mm -hmm. later about that. But it's, uh, uh, if, if I'm around people or in a stressful situation for very long, I, I'm not a very pleasant person to be around. Right. There were those who claim I wasn't before. But. All right. So um, what do you do? How do you spend your time? Well, I used to, I used to raise horses when the kids were little. Uh, I was a stay-at-home dad and my wife worked for the post office. Mm -hmm. she, had, she liked to get out and do mm -hmm. stuff, so that worked out real well. And I like to work with my hands. And I built some things. And uh, we moved, because of the fires, forest fires, we moved over to some land we owned and built a, a 
barn, garage shed, and a, and a house. And our house is, uh, I built it so that I have four spare bedrooms upstairs so that we have company or relatives that come. Uh, they have their own area. Mm -hmm. I hate to have somebody come around. I hate to go stay somewhere and have to sleep on somebody's couch and I feel like I'm mm -hmm. interfering with them. And so everybody has their own room. And normally when relatives come, we always give them a towel with a roll of toilet paper, a bar of soap, toothbrush and some other stuff. And the word is, when those run out, so do you. <laughs> well, very good. So I don't, uh, and if you come to my house and you want to drink, you go pour it yourself. All right. Now, um, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to that? I mean, you had a very, you had this whole life and, and, and career in the Army, and then that no, it was hard to leave. The, it was hard to leave the Army. Still, I miss I miss the the comradeship, the, mm -hmm. and I th I think the best time I had in the army was in Vietnam. The the you you were it was ex ex I could say exciting, but you you did something that was necessary, and the worst part was being in Vietnam because you lost people, mm -hmm. you lost people that were you liked, uh, like uh, one kid that I you know I talked to him. And Two minutes later, he's dead as a doornail. I talked mm -hmm. to my FO, and a minute later, I stepped over his body, you know, and that, that sort of thing. But yeah. well, that's a remarkable story. Yeah. So thank you very much for taking the time and well, spending without a human being to go share it. Yeah.